And there's a, just a nice set of graphics here to illustrate the idea about what's, um, what it is that creates conics. So uh, you have this yellow cone shape. The yellow cone shape is generated by taking a line and fixing a point on the line and then rotating the line uh, around some uh, horizontal or sorry, vertical axis through that point, then you rotate the line around that and you get these two cones. So the yellow cones are created by rotating a line, basically, that's fixed at a point. And then if you take this pair of cones and you slice through with a plane, depending on the angle of that plane, you get different shapes. So all the way on the left, you see a circle. And that's when the plane that you slice through the cones is perpendicular to the vertical axis of rotation. And then if you begin to tilt that plane a little bit, the circle gets skewed and you end up with an ellipse, as in the second diagram. And if you tilt it to the point where it is, um, the plane is sort of parallel to the line, um, then you get a parabola in the third image there. And then if you tilt it further beyond that, then you, the plane will sort of slice through or intersect the upper and the lower cone instead of just the bottom one. And then you get a hyperbola. So this is sort of the physical representation of how you get the, the three basic shapes. The three basic shapes of conics are an ellipse, a parabola, and hyperbola, where the circle is an example of an ellipse. It's a simpler version of an ellipse where you don't have one side wider than the other. So this is sort of just a nice visualization of how conics are arrived at. Now, so having uh, sort of looked at these, it gives you an idea of the category, but of course what we're really going to look at today is algebraically how to represent each of those three conics, ellipse, parabola, and a hyperbola, with an equation of some sort and then um, sort of how that equation will connect to the particular shape that you're looking at. These three shapes are the different types of conics that you can possibly get. Uh, and again, this happens physically if you imagine slicing a cone with a plane of some sort. Now, we have seen a parabola before, and you may have seen, you certainly hopefully have seen circles before, and maybe even ellipses, probably not hyperbola. Now, all three of these are typically done in pre-calc in one way or another, and then you would have seen all three. But if not, then most people have missed out on some of that. So we're going to basically go on each, three, each of these three and introduce the idea of how they are generated sort of physically, um, as well as how that then leads to equations we can use. So um, let's begin. So starting with the parabola, here's how we can think of a parabola. So if we have a line and we have any point, Uh, let's change that. <laughs> then we are going to give the line a name. This is going to be called the directrix. And we are going to give a, the point a name. It's going to be called a focus. So let's say you have any line and a point. Now I've drawn the line horizontally and the point above it, the point could be below it, the line could be drawn diagonally or something like that. Um, you know, all of this is possible, that's fine. Oops, let's see if I can delete this. So the orientation doesn't actually matter, it just matters that you have a line and a point. So then if you have a line and a point, then you can consider the following set of points. So the parabola will then be 
the set of all points equidistant from the focus and directrix. So a parabola is formed when you have a focus and a directrix, any line and a point, then you can imagine that there's a set of points which are basically equally distant between the two. And so let's uh, just sort of try to imagine this. So I can think of a point that's equally distance away from the focus and the directrix because there's a point right in between the two, right there, stuck between the two. Now you might say, how do I judge how far a point is away from a line? So the definition of the distance from a point to a line is the perpendicular distance away, meaning if I go from the, the point to the line in a perpendicular way, the shortest way possible, then that's the distance. So when I put this point in the middle, the distance to the point from the focus is two, and the distance from the, fo from the point to the directrix is also two. So then we can start to ask ourselves, okay, well, what other points are equidistant from the line? If I put a point over here, for example, that point would be two away from the line, but would be much farther from the point. So that is not an equidistant point. So instead, how can we get other equidistant points? Well, basically, as I leave the first point that I drew, then the way I can get equidistant points is as I move farther away from the focus, like to the right or to the left, I also have to move farther away from the line. And so that means I'm doing something like this. So then I get this set of points and I can do this in either direction. In which each of these points, if I measure the distance to the point and the focus and the distance to the point and the line, I get the same thing. That doesn't look quite drawn to scale, but that's the idea. So that this way, these points are this equidistant. And so that forms a parabola. So that's the definition of these points uh, for a parabola of, of this set of points that are equidistant from the focus and the directrix. So uh, with this idea of a parabola in mind, we then want to define uh, some things. So we're going to, since the focus is this key point, we're going to define a, a, this length uh, in the minimum position here. This length here, we're going to give that a value of P, that's the distance between the focus and the point on the parabola when it's at its minimum value, the shortest value. So minimum distance is minimum distance to focus from the parabola, meaning from any points on the parabola. And we call this the focal length. So the focal length is this distance P between the focal, focal point, the focus, and this point here. Now you may remember that this, this point on a parabola has its own special name, so let's remind us, that's called the vertex. Lots of vocabulary here. So we have vertex, we have focal length, we have directrix, we have the focus itself, the focus is the focal point. And P is the letter we use to represent the focal length, that's the distance between the vertex and the focal point or the focus. Now you can also observe since all points on the parabola are equidistant 
from the focal point and the directrix, P is also the distance down here. They're both P. So P is the minimum distance to the focus as well as to the directrix from the focal point, and we call that the focal length. Questions about this setup? Okay, so now we have looked before, so I'm gonna point this out in the past, We have for a parabola the equation y equals ax squared plus bx plus c, or depending on if you worked with um, completing the square to sort of see what the vertex is more easily, it could have been written as a times x minus h squared plus k. In either of these ways of writing an equation for a parabola, you'll always get a parabola. It always opens up or down, and you're able from the equation to graph the points, to see where the vertex is, especially in the second format down there. But there's no understanding of the fact that the parabola exists as a set of points equidistant from a focus and a directrix. Um, and the fact that the parabola has these properties as being points equidistant from a focus and a directrix ends up being really crucial for why the parabola is used in real world problems. So just to sort of get a sense of this, you can imagine that my parabola here, if I sketched it in a little better, you can see that a parabola or this parabolic shape is used, for example, if I make a little circle on the top, then this could be the example of what's called a parabolic dish, where the shape of a dish is made with a parabola in mind, because then every point on the dish will sort of have this equal length to the focal point. Now, uh, because that's equidistant to the line, it also means that if you reflect from that point off of the dish surface, then you always get something perpendicular to the directrix. And what that means is that when you have a parabolic shape like this, the, the nature of the shape takes any beams, electromagnetic beams in particular, that come into the dish and if it's a reflective surface, it reflects those and they, and they all zero in on the focal point. And so you'll see parabolic dishes have an antennae sticking up from the center where there's a receptor put at the focal point to collect these focused electromagnetic waves. And by focusing them, they get stronger and make them easier to detect. To detect. So you have satellite dishes and all sorts of radio dishes and things like that that are parabolic in shape because by having a big parabola which then collects all of the electromagnetic waves and focuses on a point to strengthen them, it makes it a very good detector of those electromagnetic waves and this is how you capture signals from satellites that are fairly weak and make them strong enough to detect and things like that. So you don't have to know all of that, but the basic idea is that because of the properties of a parabola, having all the points being equidistant from a directrix and a focus, they work very good for lots of real world applications and in engineering for things like radio dishes and satellite dishes, as well as many other of the other things. Um, there's optics, for example. This is very good for the optics for you know making glasses and lenses and all sorts of stuff. So there's lots of applications for this, but they're all built on the fact that this parabolic shape has a property, that there's this focal point. So with this in mind, the idea then is that we want to not look at our, our uh, previous way where we were just looking at equations in X and Y, and that's all we thought about, but somehow we want to express equations with the focal point in mind. So to do this in a simple way, uh, let's say, let's see if I get another line on here. 
we're going to assume that our directrix is uh, horizontal and we're going to assume that the vertex goes through the origin there we go goes through the origin of our normal xy system so this is going to be the vertex of our parabola So you may recall that when you first did parabolas, you also just assumed the vertex was at the origin for the simplicity of graphing and equations. And we're gonna do the same thing here. So if this is my vertex, that means that my directrix would be somewhere down here below the vertex. And wherever it is down there on my little example graph, I made it three spaces below, then an equidistant above would be the focal point. Where in this case, in my picture, the focal length is three. The directrix is three below the vertex and the focal point is three above it. And then from that, I would get some sort of a parabola. Okay, so when you have this situation in which the vertex is at the origin and um, the parabola opens upward like this, then you get in a format, then you get a format for the equation of the parabola, sort of in what they'll call in standard form, uh, which is that, uh, let's do it this way. And uh, in the book, they have this, uh, let me find that one, pages in the book, page 742, they'll have this um, standard parabola equation, 742. So uh, when we're in this format, then this point here is at zero P, because we know that the focal length here is P. And then the directrix is the equation y equals minus p, because a horizontal line has a fixed y value. And so then the equation that we get will be of the form x squared equals four times p times y. And they give a little bit of a, a sort of quick derivation of this in the book, but this is what we want to walk away with from that is this general format of a, an equation for a graph so for example um let's say that that we try to ignore this part for a second that was not what I to do. well if i take out the 4p you just have y equals x squared that's usually the first parabola that pretty much anyone is ever introduced to. Um, and so you can sort of see that this is in line with work that you've done before, and that would be the basic parabola. However, by having this general format of 4PY, where P is some positive number because that's the focal length, it's a, it's a length, then the thing to take note of here is that we've written in the equation in such a way where the focal length matters in which we can see it in the equation in which we can create an equation for a parabola with a given focal length and uh and that means that if we are trying to meet certain circumstances and for example we want the focal length to have a certain amount um, or we observe that it does in a real world situation then we can use that to generate the equation of the parabola so for example, just looking at the equation, all you need to know about it is the p-value because x and y are variables and they still stay there as variables in the equation, um, depending on, you know, so that you can get the points on the parabola. So for example, if p equals one-fourth, 
And then we have x squared equals y. If I put in a one fourth here, four times one fourth is one, one times y, you get reduced to this. So what that means is that because we know this format of an equation, we can look at the original simplest parabola that you've ever looked at, y equals x squared, and we can recognize that that is a parabola in which the focal point is one fourth of a unit above the vertex. So if you take the basic x squared, y equals x squared parabola, there's a point, zero comma one four, and that that is the point, that's the focal point for that parabola. So this is our introduction for this format of an equation for the basic parabola that introduces the concept of the focus and the focal length and the directrix. Questions, comments, discussion so far? All right, so let's start to get focused then on what you want to be able to do with all of this information. What kind of problems do you want to be able to do? And so the beginning place to be comfortable with all of this um, is we would like to develop the skill to use this in which if we are told information about the parabola, then we can come up with the equation for that parabola. Like if we're told where the vertex is or where the directrix is, things like that. Uh, similarly, we would like to think that if we are given the equation of the parabola, then we can see it in this form and we can use that to understand information about the parabola, like where the vertex is or um, where the, where the uh, focal point is, where the directrix is, so that we can translate from the equation into physical information about the parabola, or in the other direction, given physical information about the parabola, we can generate the equation for that parabola. All right, so moving forward, the one that we have here is when you have a parabola centered at the origin opening upward. So let's put this uh, up over here to say that that's where that goes. So what would it look like if the parabola went down? As you may recall from just working with equations for parabolas before, the parabola opens down if the leading coefficient of the x squared term were negative. By making it negative, it goes down instead of up. So it's kind of similar here. If instead my parabola went down, I would just modify this equation. Oops by putting uh, a minus sign in front of the 4PY. And then since X is squared, obviously that by itself is never gonna be negative. So if a, a positive number is equal to negative four times P, which is always positive because it's a focal length, times Y, that forces Y to be negative in order for that to all balance out. And basically that means that instead of having above the x-axis y values that are positive, you have below the x-axis y values that are negative. So uh, let me write this a little better and more to the left. So if we have x squared equals negative 4py, that's the same format as above, but this one means that it opens down instead of up. And what that means is if you know that the parabola opens down, then this is the format of the equation that you would want to have. Now, um, with normal parabolas, it's possible that the parabola could open to the left or to the right. And if it opens to the left or to the right, that means that instead of x being squared, y is squared. So basically the way you take a parabola that opens up or down and make it open left or right is you exchange X and Y. You swap the X and Y axes physically. So following along with that, if I had Y squared equals four P X, then I have the same relationship as I did in the very first equation, except X and Y have been switched. And so instead of the parabola opening up, it would then open to the right. 
And then lastly, if I make a negative on that, if I have y squared equals negative 4px, then it opens to the left. And so actually there isn't just one equation for a parabola centered at the origin. There's four possible formats. And the only thing that determines which one of the formats you want to think about to use is the direction of your parabola, the direction that it opens. Questions, comments, discussions about that? All right, so let me, uh, let me go through some examples to illustrate using those formats of an equation and how to go back and forth from information to an equation or from an equation to information about the graph. Okay, so let's try an example. What is the equation for a parabola with focus zero seven and vertex at the origin? Okay, so this is an example where we are told information about the parabola, specifically where its focus is and where its vertex is. And from that, we want to generate an equation for that parabola. So again, quickly in mind, you would want to think, all right, a parabola goes around a focal point and above a vertex if it opens upward. So if I'm told, right, we have a directrix and we have a focal point. If I'm told the focus is at, if I'm told just quick that the focus is at zero seven and that the vertex is at the origin, then I know that the, vert, the parabola opens from the vertex around the focal point and that there's one, two, three, four, five, something. There's a directrix below it. And so if I know that just from knowing where the focal point is and where the origin is, I know which direction the parabola opens up in. So from that, I know that I want the format where x squared equals 4py. And so to come up with the actual equation for this one, uh, the only thing I need to know is p. The only thing I don't know in the format, once I know the direction, is what the p-value is. So observing in this case that p is the focal length of seven, because the fo focus is seven points above the vertex, then I know p is a seven. So then in this case, since p is equal to seven, I would get that the equation is x squared equals four times seven or 28y. And that would be the answer for the problem. It says, what is the equation for a parabola with a focus at zero seven and a vertex at the origin? And that would be the equation for that parabola. Questions about that first example? All right, so this uh, is an example where we had info about the parabola, in this case, where the vertex and where the focal point was, and we turned that into the equation for the parabola. <clears throat> so the other possibility is that we have the equation given, and we want to then look at the equation and to be able to provide information to answer questions about the parabola, like where's the focal point of the directrix or something like that. 
So let's look at an example of going the other direction. So let's say instead we had uh, the equation given and it says, what are the focus vertex and directrix for um, x squared equals negative 40 y. So again, here's an, here's an example in which we are told what the equation for the parabola is. And then from that, we're trying to figure out information about where the parabola is. And the way you can describe where a parabola is, is where its vertex is, where its focal point or its focus is, and where the directrix is. So again, by looking at the equation, we can see it's in the format where x is squared, which means it opens up or down. And then because there's a negative in front of the, the co on the coefficient for y, that means it opens down. And it's centered at the origin. And so I have something in which the vertex is here. And I know it opens down. And so I need to find the focal length, and I know the focal point will be below the vertex since it opens down and the directrix will be above it. So again, our standard form for this is that x squared is equal to negative 4py. And so what we do is we match up that negative 40 is the negative 4p. That means negative 4p is equal to negative 40. So p is equal to 10. That means I would go down 10 spots. Might as well try to draw on the graph. One, two, three, four, five, six, 10. There's my focus having deviated from my very bad line down below. And then above that, one, two, three, four, five, six, 10. I think that's right there would be my directrix. So the focal point being 10 spaces below the origin, and you wouldn't need to draw this in order to come up with this fact, would be zero, negative 10. And the directrix being 10 spaces above it, a horizontal line would be that y equals 10. So I would then complete the rest. I need to get the, the vertex. And then I would say that the focus is zero minus 10 and the directrix is y equals 10. So it says, what are the focus, vertex, and directrix for the equation x squared equals negative 40y? And the three answers requested are given here. So this is how we take an equation and translate it into information about the parabola. For example, where the center of the parabola is, the vertex, where the focal point is, and where the directrix is. Questions, comments, discussions about that? How did we know that it was uh, zero, zero for the vertex? Or oh, the because all four of those formats compared to the one we were given. All four of those formats where you have a squared variable equal to a coefficient times the other variable, all have zero, zero as the vertex at the origin. If you plug in a zero for X or Y, you get a zero for the other, and that's the central point. Um, since X squared is a non-negative number, the smallest size value you can get for X squared is zero, which happens when you plug in a zero for Y. And any other value for y will just make the x squared number get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, I see. Yeah. So, so you can see it that way. Now, 
we will change the format of those four in the very next thing I do to show how it might not be centered at the origin. But anything that looks like one of those four must be centered at the origin for the reasons I just described. Does that help? Yeah, so like would that be when it's modified a little bit when it's like plus two, minus two or something like that? Where it's shifted? Exactly, exactly. So everything that we've just done will be the same if it's not at the origin, but you'd have to modify the equations a bit and I'll show that next. And all this work that we're doing to try to understand the parabola is basically going to be the same type of work for an ellipse or for a hyperbola, but we'll have a different equation um, and different dynamics physically. Okay, good questions. Thank you, Parjeet. Any other questions? All right, so let's say that uh, we now want to think about if it wasn't centered at the origin. Okay, so, yeah, let's try to do that. So you may recall, or maybe not, that doesn't look good. that one of the ways to one of the ways to see circles or parabolas or other graphs uh, you certainly did a bunch of this in trig is to take a, a standard version of the function or the graph that's often centered at the origin or starts at the origin and then shift it up or down or left or right you have a horizontal or vertical shifts so consider comparing if I have x, okay. If I have x squared equals 4py, and I have basically that that's going to be an upward opening parabola centered at the origin the way we like, and that there's maybe some p value in there and there's some directrix. Quick and sloppy, too sloppy. So imagine then that I have X, we'll say um, minus five squared and four P times y um, minus two. So if you go directly into the variables and make a change in the variable's value before anything else is done to it, in case of the x before it's squared, in the case of the y before it's multiplied by 4p, if you do that, then the solutions that you would have had before simply get translated. And so hopefully this brings back memory. So for example, the vertex on the original equation is zero, zero. And you can see if I plug that value in, then both sides get zeroed out at the same time. Well, in this new equation for both of those factors to get zeroed out, X would need to be a five and Y would need to be a two. And those values make both sides zero. They're a solution to the equation. And as you deviate from those values and maintain equality, you would deviate from five, two and maintain equality the exact same way you would deviate from zero, zero in the original equation and maintain equality. Because the deviation from X is squared and the deviation from Y is multiplied by four P. So what that means is, is that this translates the parabola over to the point five, two in terms of the vertex, which would be here. And now that new vertex still has the same focal point, still has the same distance to the directrix, and still has the same shape. So everything just gets translated 
Oops, that was not where I wanted to go. <laughs> this one went there, this one went there. And so this means that if we have an up and down or right or left opening parabola that's not centered at the origin, then we use a new format like this that just translates the four formats of an equation that we had before into new positions. And so that means you'll have four of those. So you have x. Uh, so we're going to say uh, vertex at, I think, hk is usually the common letters used. Then I would have y minus h. I'm sorry, x minus h squared equals 4p times y minus k, or x minus h squared equals minus 4p times y minus k, or y um, minus k squared equals 4p times x minus h or y minus k squared equals negative 4p times x minus h. So these are the exact same formats for the equations that I gave you um, before where it was known to have the vertex at the origin. But if instead the vertex is not at the origin, then it takes one of these four formats instead. And all I've done is I've translated the format we had before by subtracting h from the x value to make the new eight x values vertex point be h, and subtracted k from the y value, so the y value of the vertex is now at k instead of at zero. Questions? Comments, discussions about that at all? So typically, just to be clear for those uh, are going to see sort of an onslaught of information here, if you have any familiarity this from pre-calc, that's great. Usually in pre-calc, in fact, I've taught this many times in pre-calc, each of these graphs, the parabola, the ellipse, and the hyperbola, each get their own section. And they do lots of examples, and they talk about the different formatting. Whereas here, because the book thinks it's a review, they put all three of these equations basically on three back-to-back -back pages, um, jamming it all together. And then they introduce a little bit about how you could apply polar coordinates to this as well which we probably won't even get, get, have time to get to today. Um, so it's kind of like three sections plus from pre-calc squeezed into one section. Um, so it is gonna be a lot of information. If you don't ever remember seeing this before, it will take time to wade through it. Um, but hopefully some memories come back for most of you about this. And so, for example, I'm pointing this out because the book doesn't really spell out these different formats of when the, the center uh, is the vertex is not at the origin, uh, but I'm trying to spell them out because it makes it a lot clearer when that shows up. So questions all about that. Okay, so let's do one more example and hopefully we'll spend a little less time on the ellipse and hyperbola once we get the idea of how all this works on the parabola because there are a lot of similarities. Well, let's do one more example here. So how about just making this up here? Well, maybe I'll grab one from the back to try to be reflective of what the book expects from you. So if I look over at the exercise set, which is on page 750. 
Let's try 18. So it says, sketch a graph of the following parabolas, specify the location of the focus and the equation of the directrix, use a graphing utility to check your work. We won't bother with that part. So on 18, they give us 12x equals 5y squared. So we're supposed to graph this and state the focus in the directrix. Basically, we have to take the equation and come up with information about the graph. So um, as often, when we're working with equations of graphs where we have a standardized form, we have to sort of compare this to the standard form. And so the thing to see here is that the y variable is squared and the x variable is not. And so in all of our formats, the squared variable is solved for. Uh, so I wanna compare this to the one where the y variable is the squared variable. And in this case, there's no x term, there's no y term, there's no change in center. So we have the center at the origin. And it may be that the book narrows this down and doesn't give you ones that aren't centered at the origin. I haven't really looked at that, that would be nice. Um, but in this case, that's what this is. So I would wanna compare this to the format where we had y squared, and there's no negative here, so this is gonna be 4px. And when you have y squared instead of x squared with no negative, that means that this opens right. And we have the um, vertex at the origin because there's um, no displacement of the variables. So that means I know I'm going to have something that opens right. I know it's going to have a center at the origin. So I need to basically know the p value to know the focus in the directrix. And so for the p value, I would like to put the equation I was given into that format. So if I solve this for y squared, then I get 12 fifths x. Um, and so that means that 12 fifths is equal to 4p. So I would multiply both sides by 1 fourth or divide both sides by 4, however you want to think of it. And that would tell me that, uh, what is that? 3 tenths is equal to P. Any questions about how I came up with P there? Uh, oh, it's three fifths, isn't it? So I'll, I'll fix that myself before one of you smart people corrects me. I'm not doing my fractions right. Uh, four goes into 12 three times, just leaving the five on the bottom, so P is three fifths. Okay, so that tells me that the focal length is three fifths. And since this opens to the right, that means that the focal point is going to be three fifths to the right of the vertex. So the vertex opens up this way. And this is the point three fifths zero. And that if I go a, an equivalent distance to the left, I get the directrix. So it's three fifths to the left. So it goes through negative three fifths zero, but it's a line and that's a fixed X value. So I have, cause it's vertical, X equals negative three fifths. So given the equation, I'm supposed to graph it, specifying the location of the vertex, uh, I'm sorry, of the focus and the equation of the directrix. So there's the focus, and there's the equation for the directrix, and there's a graph. Questions, comments, discussions about that? Okay. All right, so let's, um, let's try to move on to the next shape and then um, 
Maybe we'll take a break before we do the last one and try to finish up as time permits. Okay, so then on page, the next, very next page, 745 or 744, actually two pages later. We have equations of an ellipse. So again, they're gonna throw these at you and very quickly sort of describe what it's about. So let's do that. Okay, so again, uh, we're going to begin sort of with a physical idea of something. And our physical idea is that instead of having a point and a line, so again, just a refresher of where we started with the um, parabola, if I have any point and any line, then I get a parabola of all of the points that are equidistant between the focal point and the directrix. So what do we start with for an ellipse? We start with any two points. So let's say I have any two points. So when you have two points, then you, then you can form an ellipse by considering all the points where the distance from the two points given has a constant sum. And that constant sum will need to be greater than the distance between the points. So for these two that I've plopped down here, they are eight apart. So let's say I have a constant distance of 10, which is more than eight. So we wanna consider all points with total distance, meaning a sum, from the given two points to be 10. Total distance from the given two points. So how could I find some of these? So for example, if I was one point to the right of this, well, let, me, let me give me some labels here. Let's say we called this F1 and F2 for our two points. And I'm using F because these are going to be focal points. So they're gonna give a similar name to the focus in a parabola but basically um, an ellipse has two focal points. The plural for focus is foci. So the an ellipse has two foci instead of just one. So if I had a point one to the right of F2, then the distance to that point would be one and the distance over to the other point would be nine. And so that's a, a, a sum of 10. So that would be one of the points that has a total distance from these two points of 10. And in a similar or symmetric way, another such point would be one unit to the left of the first focal point because the distance to F1 is one and the distance to F2 is nine and that adds up to 10. Well, you might be able to imagine that if I went directly to the right from this point, both distances would grow and I would immediately have a total sum of more than 10. 
Similarly, if the point on the left went anything to the left, it would immediately go above 10 uh, horizontally. Similarly, if I immediately went inward or horizontally toward F2, then both of the distances would get smaller and the sum would be less than 10. So I have to move up and down from this point. Now, if I move straight down like this, well, now both my distances have grown because I'm now making little right triangles, which have a, a hypotenuse that is larger than the base. So if I went straight down, both of the values of the distances would grow. And again, I would exceed 10 for their total. So as I go down, in order to stop them from immediately going over 10, I have to also curve inward. And that gets this kind of a shape. And the same thing could happen above. And that's an ellipse. So the idea with an ellipse is it's the set of all points where the distance to focal point one plus the distance to focal point two is always, in this case, 10. So it's all points, given any two points, the set of all points that have a constant sum of total distances to the two given focal points form an ellipse. And the bigger the value, the bigger the ellipse. Obviously, if you get down to the, the distance between the two being eight, then you'd only have the focal points themselves. And if you had less than eight, then that's impossible because the points themselves are eight apart. So you can't have a total distance that adds up to less than that. Uh, if you had it equal to eight, you would just get a line connecting the two, all of those points. Anyway, you don't have to run through all these examples. But as long as the constant distance value is larger than the distance between the two points, then the set of all points with that constant sum of distances will be an ellipse. And then the bigger the value, the more it exceeds the distance between them, the bigger your ellipse. Okay. All right, so uh, we want to then label some things and talk about how we can represent these types of graphs with equations. And then like we did with the parabola, we wanna connect the equation to the important components of the graph, where the focal points are, things like that. And we wanna be able, given information about an ellipse, like I have an ellipse where the focal points are here, to be able to come up with the, what the equation would be for that ellipse. The same two types of problems that we did for the parabola. So let me go up to my grid here. We're going to, like before, look at the simpler example and assume that the center of our ellipse is at the origin. And so again, in this case, notice that the center being at the origin, the origin is then not a point on the ellipse, where with the center of a vertex, of a, of a parabola being on the origin, the vertex being on the origin, that is a point on the graph. But in this case, it is not. So that means um, if the center between the two focal points is the origin, then the focal points are somewhere on the x-axis if described, written as described here. So I'm gonna say, say we have one here. So if I drew my two focal points, four units to the right and to the left of the origin, then the origin would be the center of my ellipse. So now um, let's give us some vocab. So we have foci or focal points. There's two, two focal points, so those are called foci. And so when you have uh, an ellipse, the line from through the focal points, through the foci, that goes from the edge to the edge kind of establishes the size of the ellipse in some way. Um, and so these points on the edges are kind of the extremes of the ellipse, and we get to call that a vertex.
So we, we also have a vertex when it comes to an ellipse, but notice that there's more than one. So oops, for a vertex in an ellipse, you could have a right vertex and a left vertex. Um, now, you may also notice that the ellipse will be wider from left to right as written here than it is from up to down, up and down. Oops. But we can still imagine the length up and down. So let me draw in another line through the center. Then you're going to have sort of extreme values on the top and the bottom as well. Uh, and these are also examples of vertices. That's another types of uh, vertex. Now, um, most of the time when people talk about the vertex of an ellipse, they're talking about the one in the bigger direction. And so there's a way to distinguish this. This line that goes in the bigger direction across an ellipse is called the major axis. And the line that goes as far as it can, but uh, straight up and down through the center um, in the other direction is called the minor axis. And so a vertex that's on the end of the major axis is sometimes referred to as a major vertex. And similarly, a vertex on the end of the minor axis would be a minor vertex. So you have major vertices and minor vertices, a major axis and a minor axis. The major axis runs through the focal points and is the larger sized one. So um, let's fill in some more of these details. So here, the distance from the center out to one of the focal points is again focal length. So there's a focal length, it, it's the distance from the center of the graph to the focal point, which is the same as it was for a parabola. The difference being that the center of a parabola is a point on the parabola and the center of an ellipse is not on the ellipse. But nonetheless, we're still going to um, have this focal length be of, of importance. And uh, so the focal length um, is going to get uh, a letter assigned to it. And typically, we use C. Uh, let's color coordinate. So that length is C. So the focal length is C, then this uh, length on the bottom probably here from the center out to the major vertex. So this would be half of the major axis length. Half of that length is going to get designated with the letter A. So um, let's say we're out here. I'm going to say you have points on our ellipse out here. So since I don't want to draw on top of C, I'm going to go the other direction. This length over here is A. And so I'm going to point out that that's half the major axis length is A. Axis, I messed up. So half of the major axis, the length of that is A. So then you're also going to have a minor axis. So I'm going to draw that here. Um, let's do that in blue. So 
so when we have our ellipse, we have the A length, which is the half the major axis. We have the C length, which is the focal length. And we're also gonna have a B length, which is half of the minor axis. Dyslexia is kicking in. So that's going to be B. So for an ellipse, you have this A, B, and C, these three links that are very, very important that communicate a lot about an ellipse. So the A length is the distance from the center out to the ellipse in the farthest direction possible. The B length is the distance from the center out to the ellipse in the shortest length possible. And the C length is the distance from the center out to either focal point, either of the foci of the ellipse. So because of this description of how an ellipse is formed, where you get points on an ellipse by having the sum of the distances to the foci add up to some constant number, there's a relationship between the foci and what ellipse you get, and therefore between the foci and what of these lengths you get, based on this value of the constant distances. And the relationship then establishes between A and the B and the C. The focal length affects the major axis length, affects the minor axis length. And so what we end up seeing is that actually the half the major axis the, list, the distance from the center to one of the major um, vertices is the same. Hang on a sec. Is the same as this diagonal. That length is also A. That there's a Pythagorean right triangle formed between the focal point, the center, and either of the minor vertices. And so what we get from this is that a squared equals b squared plus c squared. Now you're used to using C as the bigger value for a hypotenuse when you use these three letters in a, in a um, right triangle, um, but this is the format for an ellipse, the way these letters are defined. Um, and so this looks a little different. A is the larger value. The um, half of the major axis is always gonna be a larger value than the focal length or half the minor axis. Um, and so that's the way. It works out and it's always used with these letters this way, so I don't want to go against that. Uh, we're going to do something similar with the hyperbola after we take a break. And in that case, you'll have an A, B, and a C. And in that one, you'll, the C will be the bigger one. So it'll work out a little bit more nicely. Okay, so we've defined a bunch of things with the idea of an ellipse. First, the idea of how the points of an ellipse are generated that it's a set of points that are, have a total summed distance to two focal points. And that you get this sort of, sort of um, well, you get an ellipse shape. Now, I will point out that a circle is an example of the lips, of an ellipse, in which actually the two focal points are the same point. So as the two focal points get closer and closer together, or as the sum distance gets larger and larger and larger, or both, the ellipse becomes more circular in shape, and that if the focal points actually came together and were just the same point, well then, being the distance between the two would always be exactly the same, and then you would get a circle. Okay, so having said that, I talked about parabolic dishes before and how parabolas were very important with this physical property. So let me just sort of really quickly mention that an ellipse is important maybe even more so than a parabola. Um, it certainly was early on in mathematics because, um, well, for example, in um, due to um, laws of physics, Newtonian laws of physics, 
anytime one body orbits another body due to gravitational forces in space, you, they, the format is an ellipse. So the moon orbiting around the Earth is traveling in an ellipse. The Earth orbiting around the sun is traveling in an ellipse. All the planets in our solar system traveling around the sun are traveling in an ellipse. Comets travel in an ellipse. Um, so sort of that's the central idea very quickly why this became an important shape early on. And actually um, trying to get the area swept out as something goes around in an elliptic pattern, uh, like we did with our um, polar coordinate area functions in the last section, that's why calculus was made. Calculus was created in order to get the area of orbiting bodies traveling in an ellipse around each other um, because that's how you could better predict like, you know, orbiting like when the when Halley's Comet will come or when the Earth goes around the Sun, exactly where it's going to be when or the moon around the Earth, etc. So anyway, so there's definitely real world applications to this stuff um, immediately. In fact, the real world applications of ellipses is what was the inspiration that created calculus in the first place, even though since then it's been used for a gazillion other things. Okay, so there's the, there's the motivation. Here's the setup of the situation. We now have to introduce the equations. So let me erase some of this, leave my main picture here. Okay, so if we have an ellipse as shown here, centered at the origin with some focal points sitting over there, which create this A, this B, and this C length, then the equation is of the form x squared, uh, already sloppy, there we go, x squared over A squared plus Y squared over B squared equals one. Again, where A and B are the major and minor axes lengths cut in half, and they have a relationship to C, the focal length, given by the equation A squared equals B squared plus C squared. So, you know, you can sort of imagine a couple things about this more quickly if you can just to see that it makes sense for example uh, this point here since it's uh, um, a major vertex and again the book may just call that a vertex but since it's a spaces away from the origin at zero zero this would be a zero similarly this would be minus a zero. This is zero minus b. That point is zero b. And the focal points are at c zero and at negative c zero. Again, where c is the focal length. Okay, so given an equation, we want to be able to describe graphically the ellipse, meaning where are the foci, where vertices, um, and eventually even where's the center if it's been shifted from the center in some way. And similarly, given information about the ellipse, like where its foci are or where um, uh, vertices might be, we would like to be able to come up with an equation for that ellipse. All right, so let's look at an example to illustrate this. Should I can shrink this down. Uh, and again, I'll just grab one from the book. 750, I think it was, yeah. All right, so I'm gonna look at uh, one of the ones where it says, sketch a graph of the following ellipse plot and label the coordinates of the vertices and the foci and find the links of the major and minor axis 
then you use a graphing utility to check your work. So it's got a lot of that vocabulary that I was just introducing. And maybe let's take a look at lucky number 28. So it gives x squared over 9 plus y squared over 4 equals 1. So the only things that are going to change are the a and the b. Well, in the equation, it's a squared and b squared. And basically, once you're told those, because of the Pythagorean relationship up here, then you'd be able to figure out c. And then you know everything about the ellipse. <laughs> so um, from what's given here, since a squared is 9, I'm going to do a little math and say that a is 3. And since b squared matches up with a 4, because they're being nice to us, that means b is equal to 2. And then I know that a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared. And I can solve that for c. So I would get 9 minus 4, take a square root, is square root of 5. So I was able, by looking at the equation and knowing what the form is, I was able to come up with a, b, and c. And it asked me to give, well, to sketch a graph. So it's centered at the origin. So let's sketch a graph. And I would go out to 8, 3 to the right, and 3 to the left for the major axes, and up 2 and down 2 for the minor axis. And I would sketch my ellipse. And I know at square root of 5, which is something a little bit more than 2, there's a focal point here and a focal point over there. There's my quick, crappy little sketch with not a lot of space. But specifically, then it says to label the coordinates of the vertices and foci, find the lengths of the major and minor axes, stuff like that. Okay, so for example, this is at 3, 0. So that's the, a major vertex. Minus 3, 0, 0, 2, 0, minus 2. There's all of the vertices. This focal point is C is square root of 5. So that's square root of 5 to the right of the origin of the 0. And that would be minus square root of 5, 0. Um, maybe I've lost the screen a little bit here. There we go. Uh, and I'm supposed to identify some lengths. So major access length is equal to 6, because it's 3 on each side. And the minor access length just not writing these out, would be 4, distance from top to bottom. So they, they ask for a major and minor axis length because basically the way you can describe the size of an ellipse is the big direction, how wide is it, and the small direction, how wide is it. So from left to right, it's 6, and from top to bottom, it's 4, right in the middle. I think that's all they ask for. Foci, links, yeah, that's it. So this was an example of being given an equation, just looking at it and doing a little bit of a calculation to be able to come up with a graph and all of the relative information. Questions, comments, discussions about how we went from an equation to the graph information? Okay, so uh, the other direction to be able to understand the situation well enough and answer problems is if I'm given information about the ellipse, could I come up with the equation for it? Meaning told maybe where the foci were or some information. So let's try one of those. Uh, I'm gonna leave everything up there as it is. 
And I think I'm gonna stay on this same page to grab another example. Okay, so then let's look at one of the problems that wants you to go in the other direction. Maybe lucky number 34. So in 34, it says, find an equation of the following ellipse, assuming the center's at the origin, sketch a graph and uh, by labeling the vertices and the foci. So I'm not gonna sketch the graph, we're just gonna focus on finding the equation because you could draw in the picture. So it says we have an ellipse with vertices plus minus six zero and foci at plus or minus four zero. So uh, they've just said vertices. They didn't say major or minor vertices. And if they are not specifying, that means those are the major vertices, meaning the vertices in the extreme biggest direction. And they may not, they have major and minor axis, but they may not translate the language of major and minor from the axes to the vertices. Different books handle that differently. <clears throat> okay, so, all right, I'll make a little sketch just to tell myself what's going on. <laughs> So I have a spot over here at six and over here at minus six. And then I have foci at four and minus four. Again, the foci are not on the ellipse. So then somewhere like that. Now I'm not drawing this sketch well yet because I don't know what the minor vertices are, but those can be calculated. And to make a good sketch, I would need to be able to label those and say what they are. Um, but for the moment, let's come up with the equation. So what do I need to do to come up with an equation? So for an equation, since we already know it goes to the origin, all we need is A and B. Then I plug those into the denominators in my equation and I'm good to go. And we know that this is A and we know that the four value is c. And we know again that a squared plus b squared equals c squared, so that's how we can figure out b, and then we know a and b, then I can plot these points correctly, knowing what b is, and I can make the equation. So that's the idea. So I would know that a squared is equal to b squared plus c squared. So that's 36, uh, four squared is 16, so b squared equals 20. So that means b, I'll just write b squared equals 20, because that's what we need for the equation. So I can now write the equation. I have x squared over a squared, and a is six, so that's 36 and y squared over b squared, which is 20, equals one. So that's the requested equation. And I could uh, go in and fill in these points here real quick as um, for the minor vertices as being square root of uh, zero, square root of 20, and zero minus square root of 20. <laughs> so zero. If I was sketching my graph and labeling the key points. So that's how, if we were told uh, in this case, a couple vertices and the foci, we could come up with the equation for the ellipse and sketch a picture, and including, fill in, including filling in all the key points. <clears throat>